Okay, folks, let's begin our lecture on volcanoes now. Uh, right here, we have the Google Earth satellite view of the island of Hawaii. So this is, uh, as we've learned already in this course, this is a hotspot volcano. We've also learned something about the composition. We've learned that it's mostly basalt that's being erupt erupted here, which means that it's mafic. And we've also talked briefly about how the eruptions that happen in Hawaii tend to be pretty gentle. They're not big explosive eruptions with huge ash clouds. Uh, and we're gonna learn a little bit more today about the connection between those two. We're also gonna learn why exactly it is that this can be such a huge volcano, right? We see at least uh, one of the volcanic craters here and it extends for tens of miles in each direction. And it, that even goes out along the seafloor. All of this would be included in the whole volcano, all that area. So we're going to talk a little bit about all that today. So just briefly, volcanoes we can consider as windows through which we can see the interior of the Earth, or at least we can understand something about it by understanding the stuff that's coming up through them. They help us understand the plate tectonic process and the process of mantle convection. And they are also they're deeply connected to Earth's atmosphere and hydrosphere. So they're one of those interactions within the Earth system that connects the lithosphere to the atmosphere and to the hydrosphere, both in how volcanoes affect these two things and also in how they are in turn affected by the atmosphere and the hydrosphere. I'm gonna break this up into four parts. First, we'll talk about volcanic deposits, and then we will get into some more information on eruptive styles and landforms that result from volcanic eruptions. We'll talk about the global pattern of volcanism and connect it to plate tectonics. And then we'll talk in detail about volcanism and human affairs. So both good and bad effects of volcanism that affect humans. First, let's take a cartoon view of, of sort of a cake slice of the earth and looking at one of these volcanoes and some of the pieces of the volcanic geosystem. So when a volcano forms, it's forming because it's being fed by magma, right? Liquid, molten rock material, um, mostly silicates. And that magma is going to start out probably somewhere even below the lithosphere. Some of it's going to start out in the mantle and some of that mantle material, just a little bit, remember, melts, and that will end up rising. And at some point, it will find a pocket in which it will sit called a magma chamber. So these magma chambers are sort of storage areas for this magma that will erupt as lava eventually in some of these volcanoes. Magma chambers can also fill uh, and, and feed these different intrusions, right? Like we've talked about dikes and sills before. And this diagram sort of shows the complex ways in which they can interact. You might have a dike that feeds into a sill and then continues upward through another dike into another sill, depending on where the planes of weakness are in a rock. If any of these eventually breaches the surface, that is one place where you will have an eruption. Then you will form extrusive rock there. Uh, on the flanks of a volcano, you can have some of these eruptions, but the majority of an eruption usually will think of happening through the central vent, right? The central vent would be right here on this volcano and in, is where most of that magma is going to come up and erupt on the surface as lava. Although some of those then are going to have uh, dikes forming in them that are going to feed side vents. So you can have eruptions from the central vent or the side vent. We can also talk about uh, the pipe, the, that is the conduit that feeds magma into this volcano. And then once the flows are actually out on the surface, we'll call them lava flows. So that just about touches on all of this vocabulary that I want to get out. Um, next, we're going to look at just a general sequence of events and much like the volcano is going to start from the bottom and erupt to the top, you're going to want to follow these this way. So the magma is going to originate in the asthenosphere, that's sort of the upper middle mantle, right? Some of that magma, uh, you're going to have some partial melting of the rocks there that produces magma, which then rises through the lithosphere to form a crustal magma chamber in some pocket within the lithosphere. If that magma erupts, then uh, the lava can erupt through central vents and side vents and accumulate on the surface of a volcano. 
So a volcano is intimately related to the lava that erupts because the volcano itself is actually built of these successive eruptions of lava. And you can see some of those laid out here. This is one instance in which we can't use that principle of original horizontality, right? Because these eruptions are sort of uh, forming on this diagonal surface. They flow, but they only flow slowly. And so they sort of pile up and end up building sort of a cone-shaped volcano instead of uh, lying very flat. Remember, these are igneous rocks too. So we're already thinking we shouldn't necessarily be using that principle of original horizontality, which is uh, really refer refers more to sedimentary uh, processes. So one thing that I want to get across is that there are two factors that are introducing the magma from deep up onto the surface. So one is that liquid magma, because it's a liquid, um, in this case, liquid magma is less dense than the rock around it. So it rises due to buoyancy. Because it's less dense, then it tends to rise because the other rocks around it want to sink due to gravity. So the net result is that liquid magma is going to rise at least from the asthenosphere up into the lithosphere somewhere. But then ultimately what's going to drive most of this eruption is not that buoyant rising all the way to the surface, but another uh, uh, factor that's going to be important is gas pressure. So remember, these magmas aren't only liquid. They're going to have a little bit more of like a slush. They'll have a slurry of other minerals in them, but they'll also have dissolved gases in them. And as those gases start to separate out of the magma, they're going to put pressure on that magma. And that pushing is what's ultimately going to force the magma to erupt. That gas pressure is also important because uh, if it is able to push the lava out sort of gently and gradually, you end up with a very gentle eruption. But if it builds up and up and up because there's something blocking the eru eruption until you have a whole lot of gas pressure, then that gas pressure will all be released at once and you'll have a very explosive eruption. That's going to be tied to the composition of the magma, uh, as we'll talk about soon. But the ultimate thing that's actually pushing that magma up onto the surface as lava is this gas pressure, and you should know that. So let's talk about the different types of lava. And we've seen some of these before, but then we'll also talk about what they actually look like once they've formed on the surface in some cases. So basaltic lavas, they tend to be hotter. Remember that mafic minerals tend to have lower, or ex excuse me, they tend to have higher melting points. Basaltic lavas have higher melting points, which means that if it's still liquid, it tends to be pretty hot. It's on the hot end of uh, the uh, magma spectrum, the lava spectrum, in terms of temperatures that we normally see. And it can come out and it can make a'a -a or pahoehoe or pillow lava deposits, which are different uh, forms of lava that we can actually see on the surface once they've crystallized, different morphologies. So here's a view of two of those um, forming probably in a deposit in Hawaii is where a lot of these pictures end up being taken. Um, these are both, right, they're formed from basaltic lava which means that they're mafic. You can look at these and probably guess that they're probably mafic. Um, we have a'a listed shown here and pahoehoe shown here. A'a is this kind of crumbly, sharp looking deposit. Um, the way that you can remember it is if you imagine stepping on this, it would be really sharp. You'd probably go ah, ah, as you step on it. So sometimes when that lava erupts uh, and forms on the surface, it's actually going to leave this a'a deposits behind. In contrast, sometimes it forms pahoehoe, which are these sort of weird ropey looking flows of lava, um, but they both have the same composition and the differences are uh, probably related more to things like how much gas is already um, exhaled from it once it's actually flowing across the surface. This looks like it might even be still liquid right now, but if we're looking at this picture here, it's actually solidified at this point, it just forms these weird ropey structures. If you see those ropey structures, think that's pahoehoe. One other form that it can take that's unique to the seafloor uh, are pillow lavas. And if you ever see deposits that look like these sort of pillow lavas as, as they're extruded um, with you know, these pillowish shapes, they look like you know, these sort of weird lobey shapes with some striations along the side, uh, formed because the very surface of these flows is cooling very quickly as it contacts the um, the ocean water, which is able to conduct heat away from them very fast, even as the center of them still stays molten and sort of extrudes them like um, 
a little bit like pushing Play-Doh through those, those old Play-Doh um, toys. These pillow lavas are indicative that the eruptions happen on the seafloor. So if you ever see them in a deposit of rock on the surface, you can guess that that was probably seafloor rock when it was forming. So a'a, uh pahoy -uh, hoy, and pillow lavas are different morphologies of basaltic lava flows once they have solidified. So that was basaltic lavas. We also have andesitic lavas, right? The difference here is these are mafic in composition. These are intermediate. And these are felsic. And we're not going to talk about specific uh, morphologies of deposits on these, but we are going to talk about the characteristics of these eruptions. So basaltic lavas are the hottest. Andesitic lavas are intermediate. And rhyolitic lavas are the coolest. And remember, that's connected to the melting points of these minerals. So felsic minerals have the lowest melting points, tend to. Mafic minerals or ma lavas of mafic composition tend to have the highest total overall melting points. So that means if they're still liquid, because they're lavas, the basaltic lavas are going to be hotter than the andesitic, which are going to be hotter than the rhyolitic lavas. That's also going to affect uh, what we call their viscosity, which is how thick they are. So the hotter stuff, because it's hotter, it's going to be runnier. And the rhyolitic stuff, because it's cooler, is going to be less runny. It's going to be more sticky. It's going to be more viscous. So this is less. This is more viscous, AKA sticky. We often talk about the viscosity of liquids. If you think of something like water, it's less viscous than something like molasses would be. The molasses flows much more slowly. It's much stickier than the, than the water is. Uh, the same sort of difference applies here, where the basaltic lavas are going to be less sticky, less viscous than the rhyolitic lavas. Part of the reason for that is the temperature. Part of the reason for that is the composition. So in addition to the temperature, remember that these mafic minerals are less polymerized. The silicate tetrahedra in them are less connected together. These are more polymerized. That polymerization makes the lava more sticky. So when there's less of it, it's less sticky. When there's more of it, it's more sticky. So both of these factors, the temperature, and the composition both feed into why the basaltic lavas are less viscous and the rhyolitic lavas are more viscous. So somewhere like Mount St. Helens in Washington state, it's built out of andesite. And you can see one of those andesitic eruptions here. This andesite style, right? This andesite composition lava it's intermediate in composition. And you also notice that this eruption is explosive. Andesitic and rhyolitic composition lavas tend to be associated with more explosive eruptions, whereas basaltic lavas tend to be associated with relatively gentle eruptions. Now, why is that? We've talked about this a little bit already in this course. But let's see if we can put some of this information together. Why are the mafic basaltic magmas less dangerous than the felsic and intermediate magmas? Think about that for a second. You might consider pausing the video to think about it. And then come back here. So we've already talked about how, for two different reasons, the mafic lavas are less viscous than these other ones. Right? Both temperature and composition matter to them. Now, what does that mean? Well, remember that eruptions are partially controlled by the gas pressure building up. Less viscous magmas allow 
gas bubbles to pass through them easily. The gas can rise through. Uh, the gas can easily push uh, that magma out very gradually uh, because that magma allows the gas bubbles to pass and it's also less viscous, which means it flows easily. In contrast, intermediate and of magma gas pressure builds up. Mafic, ma uh, mafic lavas, thus, are going to flow gently across the surface, whereas intermediate and felsic lavas tend to build up pressure until it explodes. So as a result, with something like mafic eruptions, all you really have to contend with is this gently flowing lava which yes, if it touched you, it would be very dangerous to you, but this lava is flowing at something like two miles per hour at most. Uh, and because it's flowing so slowly, people can generally get away from it pretty easily. It will certainly destroy houses and things like that, um, but the lava itself is not that dangerous. Um, you don't end up having the same sort of big explosions of pyroclastic material. You can still have some, but it's definitely less. Whereas the real danger from these intermediate and felsic volcanoes is going to be things like the ash cloud, the pyroclastics uh, that can flow down slope, these big ash clouds and these mixtures, these sort of air slurries of material can flow down slope at hundreds of miles per hour. You're not outrunning that, you're not out driving that. So if one of these explodes and you're too close, you will die. And the root of that is really that the gas pressure is allowed to build up in intermediate and felsic eruptions, whereas in mafic, the gas tends to pass through. Or if it does build up, it just pushes that lava out gently because it runs so easily. Let's take a look at how that affects the shape of volcanoes that form from these as well. So right, basalt, this is our mafic stuff. I said that it was runny. And that also means that the layers tend to, to run further and end up forming these flatter layers as they run because they're, they flow easily across the surface. They flow gently. They're still you know, more viscous than water is, but they're a lot less viscous than the other flows here, the andesite and the rhyolite flows. So you end up with thinner, flatter layers, and you end up with these volcanoes that are a very gentle slope to them. Whereas with andesite and rhyolite flows, they tend to pile up a little bit more and you end up with steeper walls on your volcanoes. So actually one way that you can tell the difference just by looking at a volcano is how steep the slope is. And that's also connected to the viscosity of the magma. The more viscous andesite and rhyolite tend to build up. They don't tend to flow very far because they're very viscous. They resist flow. As a result, they pile up and you get steep sloped volcanoes. With basalt flows, you get very shallow sloped volcanoes. And we're gonna see that the, the two main types of volcanoes that we're gonna talk about are shield volcanoes with this very gentle slope and stratovolcanoes with much steeper slopes. That is connected to the composition and the viscosity of the lava that produced them. So keep that in mind. We've talked a little bit about the effects of composition now on volcanoes. Let's talk a little bit more about the texture of volcanic rocks and remind ourselves of some of the different textures that we might see. Remember that the texture reflects the conditions under which these rocks crystallize or form, related largely to cooling rate, but also to things like how much gas there is. Uh, if you have a vesicular texture, that means that there were lots of bubbles in your magma or once it reached the surface in your lava. And that can reflect uh, things like how much gas is actually dissolved in the magma. It can reflect uh, how shallow or deep 
the, the lava deposit actually is and uh, how fast it is cooled, things like that. But generally, when you see vesicles, that tells you something about there was gas that was actively being released from that lava as it was flowing across the surface. In some cases, you can have glassy textures. Remember that that means there's no crystals. And that glassy texture tends to refer to things that are also pyroclastic. That means that they were tossed up out of a volcano made of broken pieces of volcanic material. Here's a picture of some of those vesicles and basalt. And you can actually, this is a, a lava flow that, you know, it might've been flowing in this direction, say. And as it was flowing, gas was being released from all of the lava at once. But which way does, do gas bubbles go? They percolate upward and they collect. And so you see that the bubbles themselves actually get larger and larger as they go up in this deposit. This is actually a good way for us if we had an ancient lava flow and we were trying to figure out which way was up at the time if rocks had been turned over, um, you could look for the direction that these bubbles are larger because the bubbles actually are percolating upward as that uh, lava is cooling. But these bubbles, the, at least the, the shapes of them here, they got locked in once the lava cooled too much. And so that's why we can still see the remnants of those bubbles today because the lava cooled too fast and solidified around those bubbles. Let's talk about types of uh, pyroclastic deposits and names that we give to some of the, the, the individual pieces that come out of volcanoes. So we can talk about volcanic ejecta. These are pieces, solid pieces that are thrown up into the air, like ash, very fine particles, and can be moved by wind. And you can also have something called volcanic bombs, which are larger particles so things like, like pebbles to boulder sized. That get thrown out of a volcano. So oftentimes if you have a volcanic bomb, at least the surface of it is going to be very glassy in texture because it's been thrown into the air. The center might be a little bit more fine grained rather than glassy, um, but at least the surface is going to have that very glassy texture. So oftentimes you'll see obsidian associated with this. Pyroclastic flows, these flow more along the surface. They can include things like ash clouds that are flowing along the surface. They can include lahars, which they mix with water uh, and mud flows on the surface. And they produce deposits of volcanic tuff. This is a, a rock that's made of welded ash. So that ash settles out still hot enough that it welds together and it makes this rock called a tuff. And then there are also volcanic breccias. So remember that breccias, when we referred to them before, they were these sedimentary rocks that had large angular clasts in them. These might form from things like flash floods or landslides associated with the volcano erupting. Perhaps it breaches the side and there was a, a lake in your volcano's crater. Uh, perhaps it melts a glacier uh, as it's erupting and now it mixes with all this water and flows down slope. Uh, but the deposit that it leads behind uh, can be called a breccia, formed from a sort of flash flood that included some of this volcanic material. So here's a picture of a pyroclastic eruption that happened in Costa Rica. What we see, we can see um, at night that this material was very hot and because it was very hot, it actually glowed and emitted light. A lot like if you've ever seen the coils in an electric oven glowing, that's because electricity is being passed through them. It's adding energy to those coils. Those coils heat up and when things get hot, they give off light. Doesn't matter what it is. If a thing gets hot enough, it will actually give off light as radiation. It's a type of energy being released. So we can see that, that thermal radiation coming off of this in the form of light. So we can see uh, these flows, volcanic flows coming across the surface, right? So that's liquid lava. But then we also see 
flying through the air, we see evidence of pyroclasts. These are just trails that uh, have been left because they, they probably exposed this picture for a couple of seconds. Um, but you can see the trails that are representing particles that are somewhere between pebbles and boulders in size being tossed out of this volcano. And what's providing the force that's tossing them? It's all the force of the gas pressure that's built up and is tossing this stuff out. Here's an example of a volcanic bomb, right? So these things can be really big when they hit and the surface is gonna be obsidian. And if you break that surface away, like looks like it's been done here, this is probably more fine grain stuff. Or athenitic, if we remember that vocab word. But this was actually tossed out of a volcano might have hit somewhere upslope and then rolled downslope, but it didn't just form here, it was actually thrown through the air at some point, which speaks to the force that these volcanoes can, can exhibit. Here's that volcanic tuff. So this is a deposit made from welded ash. And it's sort of one of, it's, is it an igneous rock or is it a sedimentary rock? And the answer is yes, because it has features of both. A lot of this, right, this ash that has just formed, we can think of in terms of composition terms that we would get from thinking about igneous rocks. So it's this stuff is very light in color. So I'm guessing that this is either andesitic or rhyolitic in composition. And that tells us something about where the eruption is probably happening, somewhere like a convergent plate boundary maybe, uh, but not, I would guess, in Hawaii where it's all mafic. Right. So we can think about that when we're looking at the tuff. But we can also think about sedimentary depo uh, processes depositing these rocks. And it looks like we have some ash particles that had sort of a flat shape. Some of them are tilted and some of them are flat. But looking at these, uh, it probably was deposited running in one of these two directions. Because as those particles are settling, right, they're going to settle flat side aligned, you know, as best as gravity can align it, lying flat. Here's an example of volcanic breccia. So some of these are probably rocks that formed as the volcano was eruption, uh, erupting, right? We see some uh, vesicular rock here, and it's bright red in color. So is it oxidized iron, or, or is that evidence of some feldspar in there? It's hard to tell from back here. So I'm not gonna make any guesses on that. But some of these rocks are probably also pre-existing rocks that were sitting on the flank of that volcano. Since the volcano was probably mostly built from the volcanic processes, these are probably also igneous rocks, igneous clasts. But then they're entrained in this sort of, you know, muddy material, this matrix here. Very poorly sorted. that's holding up all of these really big clasts. So right, you go from clay-sized particles up to boulder-sized particles in these volcanic breaches. These probably formed as a slurry of, of mud and new volcanic rocks and water all flowed down slope at once very fast, would have been very destructive if you were in the area at the time. Because you can see this flow can pick up particles of any size. And when it stops and it leaves that stuff behind eventually, it will form a breccia. Here's an example from a eruption in Mount Unzen, Japan, uh, of one of these pyroclastic ash flows. And these flows, right, this ash cloud, all told it's much denser than air, and so it's going to flow down slope. Um, and it's going to flow very fast down slope, something like 200 miles an hour. So hopefully these people here probably survived because the cameraman here, we found a picture from it which indicates that they probably survived this, but anybody that's up here, you're not going to survive this. 